You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again. For Options Bootcamp, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. For you, the active retail stock trader, maybe you're thinking about dipping your toes in those options waters. Maybe you've been seeing all the headlines lately about everyone's buying calls. I should do it too. <laughs> or maybe you just want to learn a little bit more about options. Maybe you've been doing a little bit. You want to try to improve your trading. Either way, we got you covered. My name is Mark Longo coming at you here from the Options Insider Studios in actually quite sunny today. Chicago. If you like what you hear, not just on this program, but for the full network, make sure you leave those reviews wherever you're listening to this. Could be Apple Podcasts, could be TuneIn, Spotify, Last FM. I get hit up all the time with new venues and new platforms people are listening to us on. We should be on pretty much all of them, YouTube and so on and so forth. If you like what you hear, make sure you leave those reviews, leave those comments so other folks can continue to discover and enjoy the network. It's more important than ever. In these troubled times out here. And you know, it's Education Wednesday. That means I can only be joined by the one, the only, the black hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli, aka the founder of Market Taker Mentoring. Don't forget the second T. And of course, also the author of one or two options. What did we say last time? Options adjacent tomes. <laughs> Mr. P, welcome back to the Options Bootcamp Drill Instructor Proving Ground, sir. Good to be back. All right. And you know what, Dan? You know, we were kind of mulling over what to talk about today. And so we thought, hey, you know, let's uh, let's put it out to the folks out there. By the way, if you guys aren't doing so already, make sure you follow us over there on the old Twitters at options. Pretty easy to find because that's where we put out a lot of these polls. So it gives you guys a great way to interact with the show and engage. You guys get to choose what we talked about. And we asked you guys, you know, what do you guys have on the brain? What do you want us to talk about? these days and because it's twitter we had to give you a few recommendations but we also solicited your input if you wanted to give us uh, an idea you can hit us up as well and a lot of people did that we gave you four choices effectively here we said you know going back to an old stalwart hedging of these crazy markets or when to roll a covered call or you know the impact of that soft bank whale that's been a hot button topic out there as well or you know the listener question palooza we know you guys have a lot of questions dan i'm gonna let you guess what do you think won our poll, sir? I'm going to say hedging crazy volatility. It's like you know our audience or something. Yes, 54.5% <laughs> as of right before the show. I do believe that actually the poll might still be live. So you could vote if you want, listeners. But the show's already started. So you missed that one <laughs> out there. But yeah, hedging crazy markets. Our folks want us to really go back to talk about hedging. I wonder why that could be, Dan. Yeah, excellent question. I uh, couldn't imagine myself. I, I can't imagine a scenario where you might want to hedge these days. Number two was when to roll a covered call with about 23%. By the way, it's about 54.5% for hedging crazy markets, about 22.7% for rolling covered calls. Uh, listener question, Palooza, it was about 20 odd percent, got down about 13.6%. It's like we had a last minute inrush of interest in the soft bank whale. Maybe it's a listener who sent that question in later. So maybe we'll get to that later as well. But now it's time to get to your requested topic. It is time for a little bit of basic training. All right, Moot, it's time to 
to get in line. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? You're going to learn options trading inside and out. Basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Pull in. Prepare to learn. All right, everybody, welcome to Basic Training, the portion of the show. We break down a basic options topic, explain how you can utilize it in your own trading and indeed your own portfolios. Today's topic, a hedging of crazy markets, is one we have broached in the past, but it's always worth revisiting. In case you want to check out some related episodes to this one, go back to episode 101, the creatively titled Why Are Puts So Blanking Expensive? <laughs> uh, episode 99, which is a similar theme, a hedging of lofty markets at the time we hadn't really encountered some of the protracted sell-offs we're seeing right now and 84 as well which was ratio put spreads as well as some crude oil myth busting in there as well so just some recent episodes where we touched on similar topics if you go back into the archives you'll find a lot more this is as you might imagine a frequent topic of discussion because you guys can't get enough of it so what are we talking about here well before we even get to let's set the scene for where we are as of our recording date here we are kind of on the uh, latter end of a pretty protracted period of, shall we say, easing in the broad market, to put it euphemistically out there. Most of the major indices have been selling off for a wee bit of time. Now, at the course, after a prolonged and protracted run-up, we're seeing uh, the S&P off about one and a quarter percent as of today, seeing NASDAQ off to close to 2%, Dow off about 1% out there as we are recording this right now. So the S&P still north of that 3,000, even 3,200 level, but again, threatening that correction territory. I actually do believe might be technically in a correction now at this point. So giving back some of those gains we've had of late off a lot of growing pandemic fears, which are pretty rational if you look at it through that lens. Our old friend Bix Cash also starting to claw back up. Remember, it broke through 30 not too long ago. Now it's starting to go back up in the other directions at about a 27 and a half, a little bit north of that right now so threatening 30 yet again not quite there but of course if this sell-off continues then we probably will see that 30 handle yet again so that's where we're setting our table for today's episode here and you guys want to talk about hedging these markets so let's talk about some strategies let's go basic and we'll start rolling from there the number one the most basic the most go-to kind of old faithful old reliable type of hedging strategy in this market what is it you probably know the deal by now it's your basic protective put. You're going out, you're buying maybe 5% out of the money, maybe 3%, maybe 10%, depending on your outlook and how much you want to spend, certainly as well. That's where you're going to draw your line in the sand, say, that's it. I'm stopping myself out here this far and no farther out there. Why is that good? Well, a bunch of reasons. It's right now, to my question, I do believe about pricing models and things later where we'll get into things like cap M. But if you believe those old means of asset pricing, you should have a bunch of different assets. And that will hopefully save you through diversification. But we all know the one reliable thing, the one reliable inverse correlation you can rely on day after day is a put. Because a put's going to do what it's going to do, regardless of what else is going on. You don't need to have other diversifying factors to kick in. You don't have to worry about correlation because you have a delta. You can rely on those kinds of things. Those are hard and fast mathematical principles. So it's the most reliable protection, the most reliable diversification tool you can really have. And also, it's going to stop you out. It's reliable. You know if you buy that put, you're stopped out at that strike, which is something that is nice. And these markets, you could sleep at night. And that's, you know, that might be worth a little bit of extra premium to you out there. If you're having a lot of stress and anxiety over, man, do I need to hover over my keyboard all day, ready to hit the sell button out there. I'm getting anxious. I'm making problems for my family, whatever it might be. Maybe that little bit of extra premium could be worth it for you for that put because it lets you sleep. You know what your downside risk is. You know when you're stopped out. If you have a stop order, a limit order, they're not as reliable for a variety of reasons, including if you gap through that strike in the overnight, which... We've seen happen many times of late. What's the con of this? Well, as you said in our most recent show, they're blank and expensive. They are freaking expensive. Before I get to breaking down some of that cost out here, uh, Dan, what are your thoughts in general in this market environment that we're in right now, protracted sell-off after a long rally? What are your thoughts and your viewpoints on the old standby, the old faithful, the basic protective put, sir? I have one uh, one comments on it that I don't think we really have spent much time talking about in previous shows, but timing is everything. 
Uh, it's called a hedge because you decide to protect yourself in case the market goes down. You don't buy it after the market goes down and expect to get your money back. That's called a refund, and the market has a no refund policy. Look at you with your fun little quips. How long did it take you to cook up that one, sir? Uh, I've been working on that one for about three weeks. <laughs> Since our last <laughs> show, you had it stewing <laughs> over in the back of your mind. Yes, that is a good truism. The market does have a no, no refund policy. Another adage, buy the puts when you can, not when you have to. Don't try to shut the barn door after the horse is gone. All these other adages, which you could certainly say we have been selling off for a while. So maybe you are a little bit in that point. So someone comes to you right now at MTM, Dan. They say, hey, Mr. P, author of Options Adjacent Tomes. I want to buy some puts in the S&P. What do you tell these people? You know, I think it's important to clarify. Do you want to buy those puts because you lost a little bit from the high? Or do you believe that from this point forward, there's a chance of a precipitous drop? You know, like you really have to be very clear to yourself with your objectives when it comes to trading options. Yeah, let's look at some of those uh, objectives and also some of the costs I alluded to earlier out there. Remember, puts are blanking expensive to borrow our own title from our own show. Uh, just how expensive are they? Let's crunch some numbers. I know you guys like data. I'm going to do that for you. And actually, I'm going to give you access to some free data. How cool am I? <laughs> we do a lot of shows on this network. So if you're just listening to this one, Options Bootcamp, A, we like you. B, you're missing out on a whole bunch of other great shows, including a show we do every week called This Week in Futures Options with our friends over there at CME Group. And through that show, we've created some cool tools to help you guys crunch these numbers for yourselves. And guess what? If you listen to our network, you can go use them for free. It's the secret code is just go to cmegroup.com slash TWIFO this week in futures options. Uh, this week in options, CWIO also works and it allows you to generate all sorts of great reports about whatever product you want. Now, these are all things that trade at CME. So there's a lot of commodities and things in there, but there's also equities in there, which will probably intrigue a lot of you out there. So we crunch some of the numbers for the E-mini S&P 500 and a few others out there. The reason I like this tool Versus a lot of others, you can go out and look at, let's say, the CBOE SKU index. We talked about this on our recent episode of, you know, why are puts so blinking expensive. But the reason I like this tool more than the others is because it shows you independently the call wing and the put wing and their relative levels of volatility. So the 25 delta put and the 25 delta call in whatever contract you want. Uh, so, and you could compare it over time. So you could see how those wings and that volatility has changed. That's something no other tool that I've ever seen does. And so if you want to get the true analysis of what is going on with the puts and the calls in an index like the S&P, for example, that's a great place to go. And you can do it completely for free. CMEgroup.com slash TRIFO. Check out the TRIFO show if you want every Thursday. It's a fun one. Let's crunch the numbers now. Let's look at the E-mini S&P. This is for the E-mini S&P. But of course, this analysis is going to apply to SPY and SPX and all the other S&P related products. They all pretty much line up around the same levels out here. Thanks to that magical beast known as arbitrage. <laughs> Let's look at some of the weeklies first. So the S&P E-mini going out about two weeks right now, which is a pretty popular tenure out there. A lot of people like to play in the weeklies. Uh, the at the money vol at the time we did this, which I believe was late yesterday, was at about a 22 and a half. And what were we seeing in terms of bids for the puts? Remember, the puts are always going to be more expensive from a vol perspective. They were about 15% more expensive than those calls. So 15% more than that at the money ball of 22 and a half, what you're going to pay for those puts. Now on the flip side, the calls were cheaper, 13.1% cheap. So the calls a little bit cheap if you want to go a little bit to the upside. Now you guys say that's pretty expensive and it is, but we also crunch the numbers to see how that compares to historical. And you can also do that through those reports. And if you look at that, you can see it's actually down a little bit. And part of that is because we have sold off recently you know it may sound counterintuitive if you're selling off these puts should be jacked up and that's the case if you explode through a bunch of strikes those puts are going to get bit up really quickly but now we've been selling off over a protracted period for a while then rallying a little bit so the ball is coming in a little bit then we're selling off the ball is coming back up a little bit but what happens when you start going through these strikes that people were buying and bidding up they take them off they sell them right so as a result you can see some of that ball come in that's pretty much what we've been seeing in the e-mini s&p out here right now these puts were nearly 30 percent rich to the at the money not too long ago a couple of weeks ago and now they're down to uh, way less than that <laughs> out there in these 25 delta puts 18 and a half percent rich they come in almost 50 percent from a premium perspective at least net to the at the money uh the calls same deal calls are actually getting bit up a little bit so calls are a little bit more expensive again that's also what you'd expect to see as you move down skew 
the skew tends to rotate like a fulcrum and the calls get a little bit more expensive over time because people say, hey, these things are cheap. Maybe you want to rally and they start bidding them up. So the calls were nearly 20 percent cheap to get the money a couple of weeks ago. Now they're about 10 percent. So interesting tools. Uh, you can do this for a bunch of other things out there just to compare and see how much these things cost. If we look at the DEES contract, let's get beyond the weeklies. Let's go to a little bit saner contract. The DEES contract so obviously longer term, a little bit saner money <laughs> that was about 20 looks like about 25 percent rich they had the money as of about oh back in midsummer july and now it's about a little bit less about 19 percent and change so that's coming in a little bit as well and the calls have ticked up a little bit as well so similar trend a little bit more muted but interesting stuff i'll look really quickly here at the nasdaq if you like nasdaq vol as well let's go out a couple of weeks in the nasdaq the at the money vol out there obviously a little bit richer it was 31 and a half the puts were about 12% rich, they got the money, and the calls were 10.5% cheap. So not quite as steep of a slope there for the skew in NASDAQ land, which is kind of interesting out there as well. So if you like that, if you want to see exactly how much these puts are costing you and how much they are relative to at the money and also how they stack up to historical, which is very important. You should be doing that if you're out there buying protection. You should know where your level of premium falls on the spectrum out there and your level of volatility. Then you should look at these tools. They're all completely for free. All right, Dan, let's move on to our next friend here. The put spread. You want to get a little bit more savvy in these markets. So of course, you're buying one, let's say 5% out of the money put. You're selling one 10% out of the money put against that. What's the benefit of that? Well, of course, the obvious, it's going to cost you less. See, we talked about that skew getting bid up. If you're selling farther out of the money contracts, you're taking advantage of some of that price of your skew to work in your favor a little bit. So that's also a pro for this one. Of course, the con is that it limits your protection. And in these crazy markets, that could be an issue out there. So Dan, we're in these crazy markets right now. People are looking to hedge. They come to you at Market Taker. They say, hey, Mr. P, I want to do some put spreads in, let's say, the S&P. What do you tell these folks? I'm not a big fan of hedging with put spread. You know, like, it's it sort of, to me, it's it's almost like the opposite of a hedge. Like, you know, if you buy insurance on your car, like, you want to be covered in case you total your car. You're more than happy to have somewhat of a deductible, you know, to keep your premiums lower, um, you know, where you're on the hook for the first 500, 1,000 bucks, whatever it is. And like, that's what hedging with a put spread is, you know, it's like you, you're just basically getting the deductible and leaving all that downside, you know, exposed. Uh, so yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, what I would rather see somebody do maybe is just do a partial hedge, uh, because then you're at least partially hedged for all that big down move, you know, like you're not worried about losing a percent or 2% or maybe even 5% you could absorb. You're worried about the big move. That's a good nugget. I mean, we don't have that here in our list of potential ways to hedge, but you're right. You don't have to always go. If you have, uh, if, you, if you have a thousand shares, you don't need to buy 10 contracts against it. You could buy three or five, whatever your concern level is. So if outlay is your main concern, then that could be a way to mitigate some of that. Not getting all the protection, obviously. And Dan has a good point there, but if you crash your car, <laughs> you want to have it all protected. You don't want to have just the bumper. I bought just the bumper plan out there. And of course, put spreads and spreads in general, people forget that, they, of course, they have a delta and it's going to be less than what it is if you're buying that option outright. Sometimes people have a hard time thinking, well, I bought this put spread, but the underlying drop that I didn't really get the movement in the price that I wanted. We have that spread delta and it's going to be a little bit lower. You need some time for those spreads to widen out a little bit. Sometimes people, they don't, they don't like that. And certainly if you explode through those strikes, that far out of the money put is going to get bid up. You're not going to see probably the value in that spread that you might hope. And so that's where people get a little bit upset sometimes with the push press. So I can certainly see an argument, Dan, for maybe uh, doing a little bit more partial hedge or just go the, go the whole hog. Even in these markets, like I said, they are expensive. The, the cat has kind of, or I should say the horse has kind of left the barn. Maybe the cat too <laughs> uh, out there from that perspective. But if you still have some downside concern, it is worth noting they're not as expensive as they were. Certainly not as expensive as they were back when we did our Why Are Puts So Blanking Expensive show. Another way you could hedge in this market, which is kind of an interesting one. This is a little bit more of a, shall we say, a, a higher tier pro level type of, of hedge is the old ratio put spread. If you want to talk about those, we had some recent episodes all about ratio put spreads. Go check those. I did those, I do believe, with our buddy, uh, Mr. Rhodes there. That's, of course, selling one out of the money put and then buying some ratio of farther out of the money puts against it. So maybe you sell one 5% out of the money put, you buy two. 10% out of the money puts uh, against it. So what are you going to do? First off, you're, you're collecting some of that high volatility in that put wing, which is nice. But then, of course, you're also putting it back to work, buying 
options that also have high volatility. So you're not really going to harvest any premium, not really going to get a lot of income out of this trade. Don't see it as an income trade. And also you're buying two of the more expensive, more elevated part of the put wing. So you're getting more exposed to that. So no income for it, but maybe in a market like this, where we're seeing a lot of craziness and maybe you don't want to spend a lot and put a lot of drag on your portfolio just to buy a put outright, but you also maybe have a little bit of concern that we could go back and retest those March lows pretty easily. And you want to have those bullets in your back pocket for that rainy day, but you don't really want to pay for them a lot right now, then this could be an interesting alternative. Dan, here I am, once again, that proverbial grandmother from Iowa. I'm coming all the way to Frankfurt, Illinois. I'm knocking on your door with a mask because it's a pandemic time, of course. And I say to you, Mr. P, help me. I'm thinking of putting on ratio put spreads to hedge my portfolio. What do you say to me, the proverbial grandmother from Iowa? I mean, my initial thought would be maybe I'll try and be polite about it, but uh, you know, you're probably just getting a little bit over fancy. Um, <laughs> Grandma shouldn't be selling ratio put spreads. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably not. A lot of people hear about these more complex strategies, and you think, oh, okay, that's cool, and you know, you kind of get it a little bit, and and decide to uh, try it out, and you know, like. There's no reason for anything, not even just in trading, but like to add complexity to something just for the sake of adding complexity. You know, uh, if it if the ratio put spread really, truly helps you meet your objective, then then great. Uh, but a lot of times there's just a simpler darn way to do it. You know, this is a favorite strategy of guys like to leave out there in his black swan. You know, you might, you might think, oh, he all he does is buy puts all day. Not so. He knows. If you do any analysis, you know buying puts over the long term is pretty expensive. So you have to find ways to finance it. This is one of the ways uh, he likes to do it. A few takeaways, though, from this in these crazy markets. A, it's not free money. Of course, you have that chasm, depending on how wide your strikes are. Let's say in our example, between the 5% and 10% strikes. Make sure you know, A, and B, whatever broker you're using understands what's going to happen if the underlying moves between those strikes, right? Because you might be on the hook to pick up some more of that underlying, unless you, of course, close that put out. So make sure wherever you're selling these put strikes, maybe you're okay with buying a little bit more if you want in those levels, or of course, close it out. Also, B, your broker's going to start taking away some margin to hold in reserve against those puts for that period in between. So make sure it's not onerous, and maybe you want to contact your broker to see how they margin these types of trades out there. So it's not just free money, these ratio put spreads. But if you are a little bit on the savvier end of the spectrum, maybe not your grandmother, but maybe you, (laughs) <laughs> and this is something you're interested in having a little bit of downside net long units. That's a nice thing. We like to be net long units in this game. You're short one, but you're long two. So in the downside explosion, that will work out to you. Just make sure you understand. Uh, we don't have much time left to get into all the nuances of what happens in that in-between world, which is where so much interesting stuff happens in the options world. But make sure you understand and also your broker you know, margins accordingly what happens if the underlying breaks through between the short one strike in between the long two. That's where things get a little bit dicey and a little bit scary. And we don't have to see what happened with some of the other, like that Robin Hood client out there who didn't understand assignment on puts, all the madness that goes on out there. So these are crazy markets. You may find yourself with some interesting issues as a result of this spread. So make sure you understand what goes on into this. But it is one way to approach it in these crazy times. Another way to do it out there right now is just do the old school stock substitution. Say, I'm getting the heck out of Dodge. These levels have spooked me. I'm going to sell my underlying. So you have, I have some capital gains with that. So bear that in mind out there, depending on how long you've been holding these positions. But now, of course, you might say to yourself, you know, I think there might still be a chance for a little bit upside self. How do I participate? How do I keep playing in this game, even if I'm sitting on the sidelines? And the answer to that is stock substitution. We talked about that many times on this show as well. Go back into the archives, look at stock substitution and those delta type of substitution trades. A lot of ways you can do it. You can go out of the money if you want to get kind of cheaper and just have a little bit of upside delta exposure. So let's say we'll keep going with the S&P. If the S&P does continue to rally, you have some out of the money calls, you can participate on that upside, but you're off the table. No moss to the downside anymore, which is kind of interesting for people out there. These, some might argue maybe that's what that whale was up to out there in the soft bank. Uh, so you get to continue to the upside, which is nice. You get to live the fight another day with most of your capital is protected. It's in cash. And of course, the con is now you swapped a effectively a 1 or 100 delta underlying for some lower delta option. So you're not going to play at the same rate again to the upside. You need a nice rally, unless you go pretty deep, pretty meaty 
in the money option. But then, of course, that gets a little bit more expensive. So it depends how much you want to pay for these things. But in general, if your goal is capital protection, you want to take a lot of it off the table. You probably want to go a little bit lower delta call to minimize your outlay. And, and so you're not going to participate as aggressively to the upside until that rally really kicks into high gear. Mr. I almost called you the rock lobster. I apologize. Mr. Dan, <laughs> that same grandmother comes to you once again in Frankfurt. She's a pretty persistent lady. And she says, you know, Mr. P, I would like to explore this stock substitution strategy in these crazy markets. What would you say to said grandmother? That it can be an interesting choice, you know, um, like the built in protection that comes along with it, you know, especially if your objective is maybe shorter term, you know, I mean, if if you're looking for dividends, you're looking for like a long term buy and hold for 10 years, you know, no, it's not going to work. But uh, but, you know, I mean, if you're looking to play a, a move to the upside, it can be really interesting. Yeah, I've said it a number of times on the network over the past month or change. This is probably one of my preferred methods of playing out there for a lot of people right now who may be a little bit skittish. Uh, take the lion's share of it off the table because we are in effectively unprecedented times. And then play with a little portion of your portfolio. So you're not leaving you know, the college fund on the table and everything else like that. That's what options are good for. They give you leverage. Don't keep all this capital tied up if you don't have to, particularly if it's causing you anxiety and unease. And certainly in these markets, who can blame you? for having that type of anxiety. So take the lion's share of it off the table, sleep at night. Again, an undervalued benefit of these types of strategies. And you can still play to the upside, but you're not playing to the downside. It's not, you don't want to play there. You want to play to the upside. Just remember, we talked about synthetics in the past. This position by itself, you know, of course, if you're selling stock and buying a call, that's going to be synthetically equivalent to buying a put. So just remember that. Keep that in mind out there. Now you're closing out of stock positions. There's a little bit different things going on out there. But still, synthetically, that's what you're doing with this one leg of a trade and also we talked many times on this show and also i know brian over there on opr which is our other show on education wednesday listeners options playbook radio he loves this strategy he's turned it into what's called a fig leaf so if you want to do a little bit of extra double dipping and maybe make this trade a little bit sexier dare i say out there then you could structure it in a, in a way where you go a little bit farther out with the call, maybe uh, six months or even a year or so, depending on how you like it, a little bit more in the money. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. And then you turn around and finance that by selling effectively what's called, he calls it a fig leaf. Some people call it a synthetic covered call, selling it against that in the money option. Now you have effectively a diagonal or a bit of a time spread out there, but it's helping to finance that call. And the rest of your capital is sitting there nice and safe and secure in cash out there. So interesting one. Dan, what are your thoughts on that uh, kind of fig leaf slash synthetic covered call upgrade to the stock substitution, or you prefer them just having the outright calls and not messing around with it? Well, it's very, very scenario based. Um, I mean, I am a, I am a fan of it for when uh, like there's some resistance above. You don't think that the market's likely to get above a certain point. Uh, and then it can be a great way to, um, you know, to, to lower your cost basis of, of the long call, that is really, you know, your play that that's where you're going to make you lose your money really. Um, and, and, you know, potentially rolling it week after week or month after month or whatever it is. So there you have it. Listeners, a little bit of a quick revisiting because you asked for it. You are a demanding bunch, but we like you. You asked for us to revisit hedging in these crazy markets. There's four, Basic and a little bit less basic, a little bit more advanced approaches to how to do it. Remember, we're not exactly huge fans of going out and just loading up on puts right now, unless you really are concerned about downside. They are expensive, a little less expensive than they were. So that's a good thing. But bear that in mind, that cost is out there. So if you're concerned about the markets, that certainly is a way you could go. Or perhaps also you can go into lessening some of your exposure as well. Put spreads, Dan and I both... A little bit less on those just because for the reasons we outlined here. Maybe not as effective as you want them to be in those moments. And uh, the Delta, all the other things people have issues with, they don't really they don't really think about them when they're doing them. Also, of course, as Dan pointed out, if you total your car, it doesn't cover you out there. Ratio put spreads a little bit more savvy, a little bit more involved. But it could be an interesting way for you guys to play a little bit longer term, have a little bit more exposure to the longer term. You know, keeping that seat at the table until this underlying turn happens that you want to hedge against and so that's a way to do it over the longer term if you're just buying puts over and over again it's gonna be a huge drag on your portfolio this is the way to do it over the longer term if you don't want to time that big downturn of course remember just make sure you understand what happens when the underlying gets between those strikes that's where things can get a little bit dicey if you're not prepared for it and of course uh, their final one which doesn't get talked about enough 
I think it should be a lot. This is probably my preferred one. Sounds like it's Dan's as well out there, which is substituting some or all of that underlying exposure with options. That's what they're for. And if, if you're in this position where your portfolio is getting a little beat up, I think it might rally a little bit again. But you don't want more downside out there. And this is certainly perhaps a sane way to go. Look into it. Stock substitution. We talked about it many times on this show and on OPR. You can spend a lot of time on our network listening to strategies about this. So hopefully that's one way you want to go. If you have a different way you're going, you're out there hedging your portfolio right now, hit us up. Let us know. We'd like to hear what you guys are up to. But these are four basic, a little bit more advanced ways you can hedge your portfolio in these crazy markets, hopefully without breaking the bank. <laughs> in the process. But Dan, before we go, where should they go? What should they do if they want to reach out to MTM? Like that grandmother from Iowa who seems to be bugging you a lot these days. Well, she just comes and knocks on my door. But the rest of you, um, you can make your way on over to markettaker.com and check out my new darn website. It's live. It's actually live. It's actually live. Do you believe it? It's, it's been like, been what, six like, years in the making, this thing? <laughs> Basically, but I'll tell you what. It was it was worth it just like owning a put is worth it. Uh, uh, it is really fabulous, and we've got, at, at least for right now, uh, a way that you can create a free account, and there's lots of really great uh, educational resources that you can get for free when creating your free account. So make your way on over to markettaker.com. That's two T's in a row. Market like stock market. Taker like take something. Take what is rightfully yours. Markettaker.com and, uh, and and create yourself a free account. I like it. It's looking pretty good. Nice and clean, Dan. It's good. A lot of happy people on the homepage, too, which is always nice to see. They're clearly enjoying their time at MTM, sir. One glaring omission, though. I'm looking here. Dan has been featured on all these outlets. I, I don't see Options Insider there. What, what's going on, sir? Oh, we, oh yeah. We got to squeeze that sucker that in there. That should be prominent. F Bloomberg and everybody else. Who cares about <laughs> them? Number one, <laughs> Options Insider. I demand that change before our next episode. Speaking of which, next episode, pro tip. If you're listening live, you can get it right now. Otherwise, you got to wait a week as we head on into our next episode of Options Bootcamp. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.